and you put it through the banking system in some kind of way so that it's now washed clean. Because it's now been through the banking system, it's legitimate money. And one of the typical ways of doing that is going to a casino and using the dirty money in the casino. Mm -hmm. The dirty money hasn't cost you anything because it's acquired illegally. But whatever you win, so even if you use $100,000 of dirty money and you only win $10,000 <coughs> back, now you have $10,000 in clean, legitimately acquired money that you can put in the bank and show as your own. Okay. That's what, that's, in, in a very simplified form, that's what money is That's one of the few times that losing pays. Yes, exactly, exactly. Interestingly, money laundering, Estimate, the most recent estimate I can find is about 2003. And at that time, the estimate was somewhere between one and two trillion. Now that's trillion dollars. How many zeros are there in a trillion? Nine? Nine, nine zeros. Ten to the nine dollars. Annually. Sorry, worldwide. Twelve. Hmm? Twelve, twelve zeros. zeros. Okay. Yeah. That's right. A billion is nine. A trillion is twelve. And actually, if you're from the UK, a billion is actually 12, a trillion is 24, but that's okay. We deal with 12. Um, just to give you a perspective of what that is, that's 2% of the GDP for the entire world. So think about the business of identity theft. This is huge business. Okay. This is just a little... Wait Yes, sorry. I mean, that's money laundering. Yeah, but the conversion is a big part, or is often a big part of the business of identity theft. So that is that's one mean? of the ways of converting the assets. Converting the identity theft into some kind of asset is through money laundering. This next slide is really just a, a picture of what I've said already. You acquire the fraudulent data, that's the first three boxes. And you breed them to be to get a social security card, a passport, a driver's license, various other no real documents. Remember the result of that breeding process is not fake documents anymore. It's real documents, but with fake data. Okay? Um, and then the conversion process. You can convert them for employment, to get credit cards, to open bank accounts. Um, to get access to secure facilities and so on and so on and so on. Okay. And unfortunately, very often, the, the converted assets are then used for, for some kind of criminal profit or to finance various, you know, various illegal operations. So, we talked about, we're, you know, we're talking about identity theft. In the example that I used, and I'm sorry, Joel, you were, the, you were just the nearest person, so now Joel has an evil twin. I'm Joel. So what, so what can I do? Well, and by the way, I'm using Joel. Remember, this is Joel doing this. Even though it's physically me, I'm using Joel's identity. So Joel's twin is doing this. It's actually, as far as all the records are concerned, Joel is doing these things. I can get a loan. I can buy a home and then of course default on the loan. I can get a job, but Joel's gonna pay the taxes because the income tax, the income tax records are gonna have Joel's social security number on it. But so I get the money. not get caught, you have to get out in time. Sure, sure. But part of this process, the ABC process, a big part of this is you don't necessarily, you might acquire the data, read a variety of documents and convert it, but you repeat this process with a whole new set of identities or a whole new set of data. So I just repeat this process once every six months or once every year. And I just keep going as long as I can get away with it. Frank Abagnale, I think, got away with it for about 15 years before he was finally caught. Mm -hmm. I can declare bankruptcy. By the way, this is all going on your credit record. So I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I can get student aid. That's another way of converting money. It's just another loan or grant, as the case may be. I can steal a company. I can abuse my spouse. 
Just think if um, who's perhaps spouse? your spouse or Joel? Joel's spouse. <laughs> Let's suppose Joel has a very, and I have no idea. I have no idea whether you're married or not. <laughs> but let us suppose for a moment that Joel has just been through a really unhappy divorce. Okay? He may even be in cahoots with me to take his name and then start doing various things. Cahoots? What does that mean? In cahoots, sorry. Um, in sync, in concert with. That's an English, English expression, sorry. It's the Jamaicanisms that are coming out here. So yeah, I mean, I can do a whole variety of things but it's all in Joel's name, it's all in Joel's public records. Kenneth Henry never shows up any place. Hopefully I don't get caught. If I do, then of course it's a different kind of problem. But by the way, even if I get caught, and again this is a true story, one, one uh, identity thief actually called the victim and said, by the way, I'm Kenneth Henry, and Jill, you already have my name, and just to let you know, I'm the person who stole your identity. Here are the things I've done. There's not a thing you can do about it. And that's almost true. Because the law takes so long to respond to the problem, you can find yourself bankrupt, unable to get employment, unable to get insurance, and a whole bunch of different things simply because I've stolen your identity. And now there are records out there that say that you can't be employed, you shouldn't be allowed to have a bank account. You shouldn't be allowed within 200 yards of kids, and, and so on, and so on, and so on. You know? I mean, the victims of identity theft can really, really suffer seriously. I mean, we're sort of talking about the business end of it, but the personal end of it can be really sad. And uh, here's a, this is a discussion you might want to postpone this, but yeah. If you think of the solutions that might eventually come out to prevent identity theft. Mm -hmm. Do you think those solutions would threaten privacy or reinforce privacy? <laughs> well, there's a huge discussion going on about that. Um, one of the things that we're going to talk about towards the end here is, is sort of the five steps when you think about security in a sensible way. Security is always a trade-off. You can have great security. You can have locks on everything, password protections, and so on and so forth. Your security that can be so good, in fact, that even the people who need to get to whatever it is can't get to it. So there's a trade-off. I can make, you know, I can have great preventive controls in place to prevent identity theft from taking place. But if I do that, the trade-off is that I'm probably going to have to give up some rights to privacy. <laughs> so what's that going to do? Is that good or is that bad? That's a very subjective discussion. I'm not sure I can give you an objective answer to that. It depends on your own personal perspective about how important privacy is. Is it a good thing, for instance? One of the things that is actually being done in the UK and in Australia is they're moving towards um, basically a national identity document. So forget about driver's license and social security cards and medical identities and passports and all of these wonderful things. There's one central identity database. Is that a good thing? They have tried to this in the year. They are trying. They are trying. They are trying. Against it, there is purely, well, many issues that mm -hmm. they argue based on the cost. That's so one argument. Let's say X amount of dollars, right? right. That's kind of, if you get into the details of the research, that's actually a little bit spurious because most of the most of the data and the things you need are actually already there. The other argument that you will hear is that it's, it's um, no, I'm, no, there's no longer any privacy from, now the government has access to all of my information because for a centralized database it probably needs to reside with the federal government. There's no other really logical 